Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, ah, it's good to be in, in your house today. And as we've come and gathered, and uh, God, I just thank you for your love and uh, for your consistency with us, uh, encouraging us, engaging us, and just thank you for, for your word that brings us life, but also just shares truth with us. And Lord, as I share from your word this morning, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and, and let uh, what I say be, be, um, be on target with, with what you would have feed people here this morning. So Lord, we just give you this hour and just recognize who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Well, welcome everyone. Yeah, here uh, is it. Is it fall yet? When's the start of fall? Tomorrow. Okay, that's the official start. How many of you are fall people? Anybody? Okay, awesome. Yeah, the leaves changing. Weather gets cool. Hunting. Some of you like to hunt. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we've been working through the Who's Your One series, and uh, we've got two more weeks this week and next week, and. Next week, we're going to be talking about Andrew, uh, how he was able to focus on his one and the impact that, that he had and how God used him. Uh, so we got that coming up next, next week. Uh, just a little confession here. This weekend was probably one of the, most, the, the hardest spiritual weekends before preaching that I've, that I've had in years. And I was talking to my wife, who's at a women's uh, retreat right now. They're all doing well, the uh, ladies and They'll be coming back uh, tonight. And, and as I was talking to my wife, she goes, well, you know what you're preaching on, right? And she goes, do you think Satan may not want you to be talking about this? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, so whenever you go through spiritually hard times and struggles, you know, it is a fight between good and evil, light and dark, right? And sometimes we just need to be reminded that, hey, this is a spiritual fight that we're in, and to be encouraged. Um, so <clears throat> we're working our way through with this uh, series, Who's Your One? And it's really been wonderful to focus on that one person that God's put on your heart to pray for and, if possible, to share the gospel with or to give them a chance to hear the gospel. And uh, so I'm going to do a little recap, but I want to do that with some questions. Uh, why share the gospel? What did you learn so far? Why do we need to share the gospel? Do we need to share the gospel? Okay, let's go. Let's go home. <laughs> Why do we share the gospel? We're commanded to, right? Remember uh, that we've heard here, Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations. That was the command. And do you know with technology and everything else, we're at the point where we're finally reaching every man, woman, and child almost in every area of the world? That's pretty incredible. But that's one of the conditions, I think, for Christ coming back, was that was going to happen. So this is exciting times that we're living in. Uh, and then, what is the gospel that you've heard? What, what, as, as you're praying for your one, you're sharing with your one, what are you sharing with that person? What are you supposed to do? The good news. The good news, amen. What good news? What is the good news? Jesus died, Jesus died for your sin. Well, first, you're a sinner and you need to repent, right? And that Jesus came, died on the cross for our sins. And what's really wonderful, when Jesus came and taught, he taught about these other wonderful things. Heaven. How many of you like heaven? Anybody? Oh, man, I love hearing about heaven. Uh, and the abundant life. That's something that we can have here on this earth, this thing called the abundant life. Man, I love hearing about those things. But when you look at the context of the gospel in its entirety throughout Scripture, is there a warning in the gospel? What's that warning? What? What? Yeah. Turn or burn, right? Uh, that's a, I don't know where I heard that. That just popped in my head. Um, <laughs> there's consequences to our actions, right? There's consequences. There's a thing called hell, right? Uncomfortable. How many of you just went, oh, no, here we go. Hell. I got to deal with 40, 40 minutes of hell? Oh, gosh. Man, and the Seahawks are on. Or No, that's later, right? That's coming. <laughs> coming later. Um, so anyway, talking about this idea, because we, we want to talk about everything Jesus taught. So my sermon title, what's hell got to do with it, right? We're talking about who's your one. Well, what's, what's hell got to do with it? Um, well, 
What's hell to you? Let me throw that out there. What's, what's hell mean to you? Separation. Separation from God. Anyone else? Punishment. Punishment. Torment. Torment. Yes. Elias. Uh-oh. He had a second. <laughs> He's working on that. Um, anyone else? Anguish. Anguish, right? Uh, there's different understandings of hell. Uh, well, just letting you know, uh, I had a chance to go eat in hell one time. What? What's hell about? <laughs> Warren's joking. When, when, when we lived in Germany, this is a, this is a town called Rotenburg, and they had a restaurant called uh, Zum Hell. Hell. I, I can't do my umlauts. Hell. Anyway, it's the German word for hell. And I said, we, I got to go eat there. I got to see what this is all about. Anyway, so it's the oldest building in Rotenburg. It's like a thousand years old. And you can go, and we, we ate in that room down in the dungeon. I actually wondered if it was a dungeon, but it wasn't. It was like a storage area. Uh, great restaurant. For the Germans, that word in the Anglo-Saxon hell, a lot of times it meant the underworld, right? So anything death or down deep. So that's probably where the name came about. But anyway, uh, not very many people can say that, right? Uh, what does pop culture say about hell? Hot? Hot? What else does pop culture say? In songs, movies, uh, there's, there's a TV show called The Good Place. Did anyone see that? My son was watching part of it. It's about hell here on earth, and these people kind of get trapped, and it's kind of a sitcom, go figure. You know, let's make hell into a funny place. Woo. Uh, what, 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 what have you heard in, in culture? Hell what? It doesn't exist. Right. Let's write it off. Let's just say it's not there. Hey, it sounds good. It's not so bad. It's not so bad, right? Uh, how many of you grew up, or right now, hell is a swear word in your house? Anybody? <laughs> Don't say that. Yeah. Why is it a swear word? Because yeah. a lot of times we use it in that context, don't we? We use it as a swear word. But hell is a, a real place. It's a real thing that we should be able to, to talk about. Um, I grew up with, you can't say hell, so you had to say uh, some of you grew up H E H E double toothpicks, right? <laughs> I grew up in uh, Minnesota, so we had H E double hockey sticks. <laughs> so, see, I was able to have preach a sermon on hell and have you laugh. How about that? Uh, well, as as a young man, um, I got my first car, '69 Chevy Nova. Now, some of you are thinking, "Oh, muscle car, right?" It was a four cylinder, right? <laughs> Uh, but, it, but it's what I could get. And I was one of those guys where my, my stereo cost more than the car. Anyone else like, like, like that? Yeah. And, and in my room, I had an 8-track. But guess what I got for my car? I upgraded. I got a cassette player. Yeah, baby. Yeah, right? I had my grandparents' um, speakers from their house in the rear, uh, on their rear place there by the window. And every time I slam on the brakes, those suckers would fly forward and hit me in the back of the head. Uh, well, teenagers aren't always thinking through, right? But um, when I was a young man, uh, this, this album came out, and I got it, and man, it, it was rocking. It was uh, ACDC, uh, Back in Black, right? Yeah, some of you were there. And boy, for a young man, uh, that driving uh, guitar riff, it's just, you know it, it's... it's, uh, it's uh, musically just really captivating. So I knew all the songs, and I was singing the song. And a couple years later, when I recommitted my life to Christ, I'm going down the road, and uh, Back in Black, or excuse me, not Back in Black, Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell was the song. That, that came up. And so I started singing, I'm on a highway to... You know the word. <laughs> and I caught myself, and I'm like, what am I saying? I've been singing this for years? What am I doing? And so I was kind of having this conversation with God and got to the point where I'd either just turn it off or I'd, I'd sing, I'm on a highway to heaven, right? i just start singing to the Lord. Um, a little, little information on that song, Highway to Hell. Out of the Rolling Stones' top 500 songs, it came in at 258. Pretty good, huh? And out of heavy metal songs, it, it ranked 23rd. So it's, you know, you'll, you'll hear it. It's out there. Um, and for the sermon, I started looking at some of the lyrics because you really don't know the lyrics of most of these songs. You kind of mumble through them, right? Uh, here's some of the lyrics of Highwood Hell. All my friends are going to be there, right? <laughs> Satan's paid my dues. 
Mama, I'm coming to the promised land, right? Some spiritual illustrations in there. Now, do you think ACDC believes in a biblical hell? No. If they did, they wouldn't be singing this stuff. Hell becomes, oh, it's a fairy tale. It's something made up. It's, it's something that uh, adults put in our life to make us do good and threaten us. But woo, we're going to party on, rock on, be rebels, the whole, you know, that whole thing. Uh, side note here, do you know uh, why there's a, a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell? <laughs> Sounds like a joke. But actually, what did Jesus say about hell? Wide is the, is the road, right, that leads to hell. And how about heaven? Narrow is the way. So it's actually kind of true. Highway to heaven, or highway to hell, stairway to heaven. So please don't look for um, theological instruction on heaven from Led Zeppelin and, and stairway to heaven. Don't do that. Don't do, I don't even think they understand the words, to be honest with you. <clears throat> But uh, these things are in our culture. And like uh, Becky said, a lot of times we just write it off. Hell, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm, it's not real. Come on. Well, this is a Pew Research study about uh, how people perceive hell and heaven. This is in our culture uh, from five years ago. These are really good uh, studies that Pew does. Uh, so this is the U.S. as a whole, 72% believe in heaven. Hey, why not? Heaven's a good thing. And only 58% believe in hell. So the people you live and you work with, 42% of them don't even think hell's a real thing. And it's not. It's just a fairy tale, something that was taught, uh, not real. Uh, looking it down, it's interesting. You come across the line evangelical. I think our church would be characterized as evangelical. Usually those are churches that are focused on the gospel. Of Christ, And if you look at that, the evangelicals who uh, believe in heaven, it's 88% and 82% believe in hell, one of the highest numbers. So evangelicals think that's important. But look down a few lines. There's one called mainline Christianity. And for that, that would be your a Methodist, uh, your um, uh, Lutherans, Presbyterians, those that, that's considered mainline. 80% uh, believe in heaven and 60% believe in hell. Why is that? Why are those folks calling themselves Christians, why are only 60% of them uh, believing in hell? Do you think it's being taught anymore? Makes you wonder, huh? As you go down, what's really fascinating to me, more Muslims believe in hell than mainline Christians. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And then down at the very bottom, my favorite, 3% uh, of atheists believe in hell. And 5% of atheists believe in heaven. Now, I don't know where that came about. I mean, maybe they're thinking, I don't believe in anything, but just in case, just in case, if there's heaven, I want to go there. If there's hell, I don't want to go. Uh, but that's what people do. Uh, just interesting, interesting facts. These are the folks that, that you live and work with. So hell is a joke or fairy tale to many people. But what did Jesus have to say about it. Well, join me this morning as we look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and see one example of what Jesus had to say about heaven and about hell. So that's Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. It's in your, uh, your uh, bulletin. It's also up right here on the screen. And this is going to be from the new NIV. One word before we begin. Uh, most of you have heard of the name Lazarus. And there's a story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It's a beautiful story about uh, faith and hope and the power of Christ. But this is not the same Lazarus, okay? It's uh, uh, somebody different. <clears throat> so please follow along with me. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. In Bible speak, it means that he has a lot of bling, right? <laughs> like that turn? I kind of like that because... When you look at gold or whatever, it kind of flashes at you, bling. He had rich stuff. He had a lot of stuff, right? At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. Uh, now, was this the gate of the city or was it his gate? It was his gate. Interesting, huh? Uh, and he was covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Isn't that graphic? 
You ever heard that as an old wives' tale? If you have a sword, let the dog lick it. You ever heard that? Yeah. I, don't do that. <laughs> I don't think that's very sanitary. Just try to throw that out there. But Lazarus, maybe he didn't have a choice. Maybe he was so hurting, he couldn't even stop the dogs from doing that. <clears throat> the time came when the a beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tongue of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in the fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm and, which has been set in place that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. How many of you heard that story before? Anybody? Okay, quite a few of you. How does that story leave you feeling? What did you feel when you heard the story or when you read it? There's no bridge. There's no bridge. Ah. Even the uh, Egyptians had the, a river sticks, right? You know? Take a boat or something. What else? How'd you feel? Grieving. Grieving? Grieving over who? For the people that just won't believe. And... Yeah. For the rich man. He couldn't get across and he couldn't get any help. You ever seen someone struggling and they couldn't get help? And they couldn't get across? Uh, or maybe you've felt like that in life. You just feel cut off from people. How else did that story leave you feeling? Scared. Scared, scared of what? <clears throat> yeah, going there someday, right? What else did you feel? Desperate. Desperate? What else? It kind of irritated me that he wanted Lazarus to leave his blessing to go back. <laughs> he wasn't willing to take care of Lazarus when he was suffering at his day. You ever seen that in life, folks? The people that don't want to help anyone, what, what happens when they're hurting? First well, first ask for help, right? Well, that's who we got here, right? It's called selfishness. Selfishness, self-centeredness. Uh, how else did this make you feel, reading this? Tro troubled, how? Yeah. And it's only, I know, through God, but yeah. it's, you know, when you want to be able to share, mm -hmm. it's, it's really saddening and troubling. Yeah. That, you know, you can't get people to hear Yeah. People. When people, when you share the good news and people don't receive it, it's troubling because we know the rest of the story. Yeah. So this, this passage can leave you feeling a lot of different ways. Uh, and I think that's why Jesus said it. Some say it's a parable because it starts with there was a rich man. Others say it was true because it referenced a real person, Lazarus. But either way, Jesus told the story to convey spiritual truth. Okay? And when Jesus tells these stories, we need to, to really understand what he was saying and why, why he was saying it. So in looking at this, uh, I have three, three things that I think we can draw from not just this story, but the entirety of what Jesus taught. And the first thing is this. Hell is real. Verse 23, it says, in Hades, where he was in torment. Uh, 
Now, I just want to draw attention. If you have the King James or other translations, you might be reading in hell. Uh, just let you understand, there were three Greek words used for hell or uh, the underworld in the New Testament. Uh, Gehenna is the word that Jesus usually used, and they used it 12 times. Hades used nine times, as it is here, and uh, Tartaro was used once. Um, there are subtleties to these words of hell, and I don't really have time to, to, to go into that, but if you want to do some research or ask some questions, I'd be glad to do that with you. But, but for the sake of this uh, message th this morning, it's important for you to know that Jesus used uh, Gehenna and Hades when he was referring to hell or judgment. Okay? So that's why there's uh, a difference in how it reads in your Bible. So we have this idea of hell, and it's, con it's contrasted to what? Opposite of hell is heaven. So what does the Bible teach us about heaven? 2 Chronicles 30, 27 says this, The priests and the Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them, for their prayer reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. So heaven is where God dwells, right? And Jesus added to this, he said in John 14, 2, My father's house has many rooms. If, if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So Jesus talked about those that trust in him and given their life to him, will join him one day with the Father in heaven. Beautiful illustration. Uh, what does the, the Bible teach us about hell, though? I think Scripture teaches us hell was created for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, 41, uh, it says, Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for, for the devil and his angels. So why was hell created? For the devil and his angels. And why? What did the devil do to deserve a sentence of hell? What, what have you learned? Rebel. Rebellion. Rebelled against God. Even thinking he was God. You ever struggle with that yourself? Or people around you? I'm not going to listen to anyone. I don't have to t listen to what everyone has to say. <laughs> I, I know what's best for me. I'm going to do my own thing. It's called rebellion, folks. So we need to believe that hell is for real. Because if you don't, if you blow it off, you might end up like Lazarus. You might. If you don't take this seriously, take Jesus at his word, uh, you could end up in a place uh, not like Lazarus, like the rich man. Sorry, I had to clarify that. Um, is that harsh to hear? Is that a warning? Do you give warnings to people when you see something bad coming? I think love is that. Love calls us to warn people if they're doing bad things that have to do with their health, have to do with their life, their choices, uh, bad things with their money. A uh, little, little plug right here. In a couple weeks, we're going to be doing a financial peace. Uh, the first Wednesday night of October and what Financial Peace is, is a nine-week course on how to handle your finances. Uh, some of you may have felt like you've been put yourself into a little hell with your bad choices with money. This is to help you make wise choices, godly choices. So that'll be kicking off. You can come at 5.30 and have a meal with your family, and at 6.30 you can come to that class. So that'll be kicking off the first Wednesday of October. <clears throat> but Jesus talked about hell, hell being real. Uh, and the other thing that Jesus talked about hell was that it was terrible and it was permanent. Terrible and permanent. Verse 23 says, In Hades, where he was in torment. Right? How many of you have ever been uh, tormented in your life? Verse 24, I am in, in agony in this fire. How many of you have ever been burnt? I heard it's one of the most painful things that you can experience, right? Yeah. Imagine that, constant. Verse 26, And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Is there a permanence in that? That's permanence. So in this story, Jesus says that hell is a place of eternal torment from which there is no return, even to warn loved ones. In other verses, he calls hell 
an unquenchable fire in Mark 9.43. In Mark 9.48, he says, where the worm does not die. In Matthew 13, he says, where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret. That's always been so descriptive to me, gnashing, wailing and gnashing of teeth, right? Uh, Matthew 25, he calls it a place of outer darkness. Uh, a lot of descriptive words for this idea of hell. Uh, is this a place where you want to go someday? No. I think that as we go through this spiritual struggle, God gives us glimpses of, of heaven and glimpses of hell. Uh, what would be some glimpses of hell on earth for you? You experienced or you can uh, imagine or you've seen? Uh, one of the main ones for me, I think, is, is child abuse. Uh, to be a helpless child and to have your parents, uh, who you, you trust them to love and protect you when they, when, when they hurt you, that's, that's pretty hellish. Uh, what else is pretty hellish in this world? Addiction, of a family member. Addiction. oh my gosh. And m many of you have experienced that or unfortunately will experience that. And it's like fighting with the devil, isn't it? It, it steals their life. It steals their hope. It steals their life sometimes. Um, uh, and I, a documentary I saw a little while back uh, with the heroin epidemic Multiple young people, they looked in the camera and said, I would sell my soul for heroin. That's how strong it is. It's terrible. Uh, there's other things that are like hell on earth. Um, someone in the earlier service brought up uh, Rwanda, some of these places, where different tribes ended up hacking each other to death uh, in the streets and in churches. It's just horrific. So there's a lot of nightmares. Um, uh, someone on Facebook shared uh, Sandy Hook, uh, there's a nonprofit group that put out a um, public awareness thing, and it was it was these kids laughing, and they're going. It was a back to school video of the gifts that they had gotten from their parents, and they're laughing, and they're running through the school, and as they're going through the school, all of a sudden you see it gets anxious, and you start hearing noises, and the kids were talking about, oh, I got uh, sneakers, I can run fast, and he's running where there's gunshots, and then it went from this happy, joyous time to these these children trying to survive a mass shooting. I tell you what, it. It, it ripped me to the core. I couldn't even share it on Facebook because it was so traumatizing. But I, these, these families of these survivors did this because their kids lived through hell on earth, you know? And why, why are our kids going through hell on earth uh, in school? Uh, folks, it's evil. Uh, there's a lot of people that will say, do this, do this, do this, do this. But the underlying issue, this wasn't happening in our country 30 years ago, folks. Evil is on the rise. It's up and coming. And um, those are the consequences. Those are the symptoms of evil in our midst. Uh, but it's, it's really powerful. Uh, and it's real. So when it comes to... Uh, well, let's talk about something positive for a bit. When we get glimpses of heaven, give me a glimpse of heaven. Birth of a grandchild. Birth of a grandchild. Isn't that great? New life. Hope. You know. Anyone else? What's, what's a, uh, a glimpse of heaven that you've had? Victory over cancer. Victory over cancer. Okay. Yeah, victory. Like a, a new lease on life. Anyone else? A glimpse of heaven that God's given you to give you hope. Sunrise, right? A dawn of a new day. Yeah. I've, I love to share um, one of the places I think I, I've had the most glimpses of heaven is when I worked with Young Life out in Colorado. I was in a beautiful place, 9,600 feet, and we had about 40 staff, and we had high school kids come up there. And, and um, uh, there were some summers where we had people that weren't committed to Christ. And it's amazing how just a few people can turn a whole community, right? Uh, but most of my summers up there, was people that were really committed to Christ and that made them selfless instead of selfish and loving instead of not caring. And can you imagine spending a whole summer in a beautiful place with people that were selfless and loving? Man, it was like, wow, God, this is, this is what you, this is the abundant life. This is a glimpse. That's why when you have your families, right, when you and your spouse and your children all get along and are caring and loving to each other, doesn't that feel good? 
That's, that's like a glimpse of heaven. But when you have strife and backstabbing and hurt in your families, it just breaks your heart. So it's this glimpses of heaven and hell kind of being played out. But no matter how bad you've had it or whatever experiences you've had on this earth, they don't compare to the hell that Jesus was talking about. Because it's terrible and it's permanent. Our trials on this earth are not permanent. So we need to realize that with hell, there's no second chances. Is that hard to hear? Is that fair? Where's the hope? Come on. Come on. I don't want to hear that. Maybe that's why society's kind of erased it. Uh, Nine years ago, eight years ago, uh, there was an author, a Christian pastor named Rob Bell, who wrote a book called Love Wins. And he was struggling with this idea of, I can't believe a loving God would send people to hell. So he wrote a book saying, all people are going to heaven. And a lot of people received it really well. Oprah, oh my gosh, that, that's right down her alley. So she had him on and, and it was the gospel of Oprah, right? All roads lead. Uh, one of the leaders in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, which our church is a part of, he's one of the seminary uh, professors, uh, excuse me, presidents, Albert Moeller, he wrote this back then. He said, when you adopt universalism and erase the distinction between the church and the world, then you don't need the church and you don't need Christ and you don't need the cross. This is the tragedy of non-judgmental mainline liberalism, and it's Rob Bell's tragedy in this book too. Uh, I think this is the main reason why mainline churches, only 60% of them believe in hell, because it's not being taught or it's being watered down or it's being changed completely. Uh, I'm here to share with you, when you read your Bible on your own, and you should, and you hear about Jesus talking about hell, he said it for a reason. He said it as a warning, and we need to heed it as such. So along with hell being real, terrible, and permanent, I think that Jesus, not just in this passage, but in in the entirety of his teaching, taught us this, that hell is a choice. And I'm not going to go down the road of predestination. Do I believe that God knows everyone who's going to be saved or not? Yes. Do I believe God gives us free choice? Yes. It's a dilemma. Both are true. But when people believe that that God knows everyone who's going to be saved, what that creates is it creates in people, we don't have to share the gospel because God knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, so I can just live my life. That's an excuse, and it goes against the Great Commission. So don't get sucked into that. But hell, I believe, is a choice. Where do we see that? In verse 25, But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. So at first reading of this, so what uh, merits us hell? It must be because being rich, right? Well, that's too easy, isn't it? Because if we compare ourselves to others, everyone in this room is probably rich compared to someone perhaps in Africa, right? But what what did the rich man do towards Lazarus. Uh, Helen raised that earlier. He was at his gate, and did he get any help? No help. Not even the scraps off his table, not even the trash. He would have loved that. He would have loved to have lived on the trash. He didn't even get that. When they asked Jesus what the greatest commandments were, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the other is to love your neighbor as yourself. Did the rich man loved Lazarus as, his, as himself. No. And he was so self-centered, so self-absorbed, that when he found himself in hell, he had the audacity to go, hey, Lazarus, help me out here. Come on, buddy. In verse 31, it says, he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Did the rich man listen to Moses and the prophets? Did he follow the commandments of God? He didn't. He wasn't loving. He wasn't caring. He was selfish and self-serving. We're called to love God and to love others. What's really interesting about this passage, when Jesus said this, he was talking to some of the Pharisees, right? And he said, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. What happened just down the road from this? What happened to Jesus? He 
He rose from the dead. So he was telling them what was going to happen. And he said, you, you won't even believe if someone rises from the dead. And when Jesus came back, guess what? A lot of them didn't believe either. Some did. Some turned. And then when you're, you're concerned about, I share the gospel and people don't turn, it grieves my heart. Well, guess what? People saw Jesus rise from the dead. They saw miracles and they didn't even turn. Why? They were following their own gospel. Me, myself, and I. The rich man ignored the voice of God and his actions showed it. My question for you this morning is, what do your actions show? Have you listened to the word of God in your life? So what got Satan sentenced to hell? Rebellion. Rebellion will get you sentenced to hell as well when you rebel against God. Now in the back of your chairs, there's a next step card, and this is our way to hear what's kind of going on in your life. You have a prayer request or a praise. We love hearing praises. Fill that out because we'll be praying for you. But I have some next steps in here, and if, as I go through these, if, if God's sp spoken to you in one of these ways, feel free to check that off because we'll pray for you specifically on this. And if you have any more questions, feel free to contact us. As, to be honest, as I was talking to the staff, to do hell justice, we're talking a full series here, you know, six to eight weeks minimum. And I just tried to do what I could with one session. But it's the story of Lazarus and it's important. So here are some of the next steps that if God has spoken to your heart this way, feel free to check them off. First one's this. God, I acknowledge that hell is real, terrible, and permanent. I will take it seriously. If you've kind of got pulled into a society, you joke about hell, uh, you're singing songs about hell, uh, what's that saying about your witness and what you really believe? Uh, change your behavior. Ask God to help change your behavior. Um, hell is in our vernacular so much. And, uh, a lot of people don't even know they, they say it. Um, a common greeting is, is um, uh, how the hell are you, right? Um, I greeted someone at the first session. Yeah. <laughs> you don't do that at your school, do you? <laughs> I grew up with that one. Anyway, I greeted someone at the first service. I go, how the heaven are you? And he stopped. <laughs> and he had to just stop and think about it. But you're looking for something you can use at work? Let's do that. How the heaven are you? Because it'll make someone stop and think about the phrase. And it may be an opportunity to have some spiritual talk, right? Um, uh, on this note as well, it's, it's uh, probably some people in your life, your past, are going through your mind and you're wondering, gosh, are they in hell? Were they saved? Gosh, and you, you worry, you have anxiety about that. I, I would share this with you. God is a just and a loving God. And um, Pastor Joe taught me years ago, he goes, I don't preach anyone into heaven, I don't condemn anyone into hell. I just preach the gospel. And that is really good words because we don't know what happens in the heart of people. And a lot of people that want to reject Jesus or reject the church, you don't know what kind of pain has been caused to them by the church. You know, so there's a lot of unknowns that we don't know, but I just, I just give them over to God. The people that I've really prayed for and were concerned, I just have a peace about it. Give them, they're in God's hands. I just have to worry about myself, right? Because who can you save? Well, God saves you, but yourself, right? I had to have this hard conversation with my kids who are all young adults now. I said, you know, when you die, you stand before God. I'm not there with you. Your mom's not there with you. You stand before God by yourself. What are you going to say? What's God going to say? So the second next step that maybe God is speaking to you this way God, help me to pursue my one and other non-believers with the urgency that hell requires. Is there an urgency to hell? There is. And it's kind of uncomfortable. It's not like, oh, do I, how do I bring this up? This is really hard. Um, a lot of times it's just easiest to tell your story, right? Uh, how God's worked in your life. Uh, Jody's teaching a class on Wednesday nights for the next two Sunday, two Wednesdays, I believe. It's how to share your story. And it's a wonderful class where we have a chance to go in there and just talk about different ways 
to engage folks in dialogue. So if you're looking for some resources, Wednesday night, uh, go ahead and join uh, Jody. I'll be in there with them. And um, that's a great opportunity. Uh, but as you're dealing with your one, a lot of times people won't bring up hell because it's uncomfortable. But I think it's important in context to bring it up at the appropriate time. Uh, I have a good, good illustration. Um, Bob here gave me, uh, told me the story of his testimony. Kind of neat. I've, got, I've had a chance to hear a lot of your testimonies. It's wonderful. And, and it'd be great if, if you can hear more uh, testimonies. Maybe in small groups we have a chance to uh, facilitate that. But, but Bob shared this story. He said I could share it, but he didn't, he didn't want to say it up in front of everyone. But um, and ho ho hopefully I have it in context. But um, Bob said he was kind of a prideful young man, right? Some of you are prideful young men, young uh, women. And people came to the door and they told him the gospel. And he listened to the gospel. And he said, well, you do, want, do you want to receive Christ? Do you want to go to heaven? He goes, no, that's fine. And he said, well, you, you, the consequence is you're going to go to hell, right? He goes, that's okay. That's fine. Just kind of yanking their chain a little bit, right? <laughs> kind of toying with them. But that person that came to the door said, okay, so you're okay going to hell. I see you have two little boys uh, running around your house. Are you going to take them there with you? Wow. Wow. At that point, you said, I need to do something about this. I need to get right with Christ. Yeah. There's a lot of folks out there, and you may be you. If you're on a highway to hell, guess what? You're probably dragging people along with you, you know? And I'm, thank God that you, you made that choice to uh, surrender your life to Christ. And one of your sons is walking with the Lord, you shared. Praise God for that. And your other son will be praying for him. Yeah. Uh, but thanks for letting me share that. But just a powerful illustration how just introducing hell into a conversation can it really have an impact. Really have an impact. The last next step, maybe this is your prayer today. God, I don't want to go to hell. I repent of my sins and I ask you to save me. Is it really that easy? It, it kind of is. God, I don't want to go to hell. I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. Now, when it comes to repenting, there's other things that go along with repenting. When you repent, that means you do what with your sin? You turn away and you go the other direction. You, you stop sinning. Jesus, with the, with the woman caught in... Uh, in uh, adultery, he forgave her and said, now go and sin no more. But you ask Jesus to save you, part of asking, accepting Jesus' sacrifice, his blood on the cross to save you, part of that is lordship, which is saying, God, I give you everything, control of every aspect of my life. That's salvation, folks. If you believe that Jesus came and died for your sins and... Uh, but deep down, he doesn't rule your life. You rule your life. You make your choices. And you, you operate from a selfish, self-centered world. Guess what? You're deceiving yourself. And you're probably getting yourself a one-way ticket to hell. Okay? It's that clear. C.S. Lewis said this way, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Did you catch that? Whose will are you doing? You're either doing God's will or you're doing your will. For me, in closing, one, one of the hardest passages speaking on this topic is from Matthew 7. And Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew me. I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. And I believe at that point, Jesus turns his back. I don't know about you, but that's something that uh, really brings it home for me. Uh, because we're guaranteed, if we really trusted Jesus and turned our life over to him and asked for uh, forgiveness and try to walk daily 
with him that he promises us eternal life, uh, a, a place with his Father in heaven. Uh, that's a promise, folks. When I die, I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I tell, I'm here to tell you today, if you turn your life over to Christ, even if you struggle, even if you, things are rough and you may not be the brightest light, but you're doing the best you can, you will receive that greeting, well done, good and faithful servant. Compared to, away from me, I never knew you. That's the other option. Is this a hard word today? Yes, it is. But it's important because um, Jesus taught it. And we have the promise of heaven, abundant life in heaven, but we also have the warning of hell. What choice do you make this morning? And as you go and share this with your friends, share it matter-of-factly, go to this passage and just say, where, where do you want to be? It's that simple.